Okay, hi, so welcome to this video on the life history of a star. So in this video we're going to talk about how a star comes to be, basically, and the life cycle of a star, which actually does vary depending on how big the star is. Alright, and so first of all, let's have a look at a diagram. So here we have a fantastically drawn diagram by myself. On the left hand side, these grey dots represent dust, right? So you've got lots of dust uh, in the, or we're in space, right? In outer space. And dust comes together based on its mass, right? If it has a really high mass, then forces of gravity pull all this dust together and they condense, right? And you have a dense load of gas, which we eventually call a protostar. A protostar, right? If I'm going to show that, um, you could have your uh, dust coming together, right? You see it's getting closer and closer and closer together, okay? And that is known as a protostar, all right? And what starts to happen in that protostar is that nuclei of hydrogen and other elements, they start to come together and actually fuse, right? And one of the main ones is hydrogen, okay? So if you have hydrogen, okay, so hydrogen plus another hydrogen, and I'll just put the numbers in here, let's say that your hydrogens have one proton and one neutron, okay, that would make them deuterium, like this, they would fuse together, and they would form helium, right, they form a heavier element, and when this happens, a massive amount of energy is released, this is a process known as nuclear fusion, if you don't know what nuclear fusion is, then have a look at my previous video where I cover both nuclear fission and nuclear fusion, right? But I did mention in that video that nuclear fusion is what happens in stars, and this is exactly what happens in this protostar, right? Your, uh, nuclear, your nuclei, sorry, so your hydrogen nuclei and other elements come together and basically fuse, and they form larger nuclei, so other elements. Now, importantly, right, the fusion releases energy, okay? So the fusion releases energy, and I said it releases a lot of energy, so this protostar becomes a lot hotter because a lot of the energy released is actually uh, in the form of heat, and therefore it becomes brighter as well, right? As things are really, really hot, uh, they become brighter, and that's why we can see stars. And so the protostar, as this happens, eventually you reach a stage where the outward forces and the inward force of gravity, right, so outward force coming from radiation, given out by this nuclear fusion, and the inward force by gravity, eventually they equal each other. And so you get a star, which is uh, what we call a main sequence star. And that's where the size of it is not changing, right? And that's what you can see here on the right. And so this one is called a main sequence star. Okay, a stable star is a main sequence star, right? And that is when the outward forces and the inward forces are equal, okay? So this is from radiation, okay? I'm gonna put, just put radiation forces. I could probably word that better, but it, it's just to prove the point, right? So radiation forces, so the outward forces as a result of nuclear fusion equal the inward gravitational forces. Okay, so the inward gravitational forces. Okay, and those two things are equal to each other, hence why your main sequence star is stable. And the main sequence star is stable for a long, long period of time, right? It might be billions of years. For example, the sun at the moment is a main sequence star. If it wasn't a main sequence star, then we'd have to be really, really worried because it would be on the verge of, you know, blowing up or something else. Depends on uh, how big it is. Really, uh, that's probably wrong. The The sun probably isn't big enough to blow up in what we call a supernova, and that's what we're going to have a look at in a second. And so this continues until uh, the star runs out of hydrogen. So we said before that hydrogen is fusing to form helium. Okay, so the main sequence star continues. Okay, I'll put a, a note here. Until star runs out of hydrogen nuclei. All right, when that happens, then other elements are gonna be fused together, but 
the hydrogen is not uh, fusing to form helium and that is the basis of keeping the star stable. When that happens, it's not able to release enough uh, energy. And what happens is the star then swells. Okay, it gets bigger, that means. It cools down because it's not releasing as much energy. Okay, and it turns red. Okay, so it turns red. Now you don't need to know why this, the uh, the star turns red rather than the yellowy orange that you're used to seeing for a main sequence star, but it's basically based on the emission of a light based on what is burning inside the star. But anyway, so your star turns red and it swells, but there are two separate uh, pathways as to what can happen to the star after it uh, has finished its main sequence if you like. So after the main sequence star, when it swells and turns red, there are two pathways and that is based on the size of the star, right? So I'm going to scroll down and we'll put the two pathways here. So the first one is a low mass star. Okay, so a low mass star and low mass means similar, means it could be smaller, could be slightly bigger similar to our sun. So even though our sun is absolutely massive, in comparison to other stars, it's not the biggest at all. There are lots of stars which are way, way bigger than our sun, and they might have a different pathway after the main sequence than our sun does, right? But this pathway is what is going to happen to our sun. So we started off, if we go back up, as this main sequence star, and then what happens next is we form, we, we said that it turns red and it swells, so we form what we call a red giant. Okay, a red giant. Now remember we said at this stage, uh, the reason it's turned into a red giant is because the hydrogen has run out. Okay, so rather than hydrogen fusing, we get helium plus other elements. Okay fusing in the core. So I said that it's still um, it's still giving out energy, you've still got nuclear fusion occurring, but the hydrogen's run out, and that's why it's turned into this red giant, because now there's no more hydrogen to fuse into helium, now the helium might fuse into forming something else, or other light elements are fusing to form other elements, right? All right, now this continues to happen until the star runs out of light elements, okay? So eventually it will run out. So it eventually runs out of light elements. Okay, and that is when it's going to no longer release energy because nuclear fusion is going to stop. Once it's run out of those light elements, all it has is heavy elements, and those heavy elements are not, there's not enough energy to cause them to fuse together, right? So no more nuclear fusion happens, and therefore, uh, nuclear fusion stops. And so I'll put that in as a point here, actually. So fusion stops. All right. Now, when that happens, the star contracts and it gets much smaller because it's not giving out any energy anymore, right? So there's still a gravitational force, but it's not giving out any energy anymore. And so you form what we call a white dwarf. Okay, a white dwarf way smaller than the star was. It's a lot smaller than the main sequence star as well. It's got a lot smaller because you've still got gravitational forces, but you don't have uh, your radiation uh, being given out as a result of nuclear fusion. Um, and so when that happens, you form your white dwarf, uh, which is still emitting light. That's why it's white, right? It's not red or yellow or orange anymore because it's not um, carrying out nuclear fusion but it's still emitting light, right? It's still really hot and it's still emitting light. But what will eventually happen is this will cool down, right? And if I go down here, I'm not gonna draw it in full black because the background's black, but it eventually cools down and then it stops emitting light as well, right? I'm not gonna write in black because you won't be able to see it. Let's write in white. And so then you will form your black dwarf. Okay, so this is the stage where they've basically faded out. Um, they're not 
hot anymore, the temperature's gone down, so they're not even emitting light, and you have your black dwarf, which is just a load of stuff with a gravitational, um, gravitational force holding them together, but they're not giving out any energy anymore, right? They're not giving out uh, light, they're not giving out heat because they've cooled down, and nuclear fusion is not happening. And so that's your end of your life cycle for a low mass star. So the black dwarf is the last checkpoint, if you like, for a low mass star. All right, so now let's have a look at the other pathway. And this is when you have a low mass star, which is similar to our sun or less. But what about a high mass star? So if you have a star that's way bigger than our sun, okay, then obviously what you get after your main sequence is rather than a red giant, is what we call a red super giant. Okay, it sounds kind of uh, theatrical, but it's just it just is saying that it's way bigger than um, a low mass star. So a low mass star is like our sun. This is way, way bigger than our sun and it forms a red supergiant. Now the red supergiant is behaving very much like the red giant, okay, as we saw in the previous cycle, where um, heavier, so like helium plus other elements. Okay, sorry for this handwriting. Elements are fusing okay so you've got you've still got nuclear fusion occurring right and this occurs in the red supergiant just as it does in a red giant all right now eventually just like with the red giant again it will run out okay so eventually it runs out of light nuclei and just to be clear, when we say light nuclear, we mean not very heavy. We don't mean uh, light as in visible light, because that doesn't make it any sense. Light is not an element, doesn't have a nucleus. Okay, So it runs out of light uh, nuclei, and then it starts to collapse. Okay, So it starts to collapse. Okay, now that is just like the red giant, right? The red giant, it then contracted, right? I said contracted before. Uh, you can use the word collapse as well. And But then it formed a white dwarf. The red supergiant will not form a white dwarf. Okay, and that's because it's so much heavier, right? So let me just scroll down here so I can fit some more. So because the red supergiant is so heavy, the matter surrounding the core of the star, as it collapses and tries to contract inwards, it's providing a huge, huge, huge force onto the inner core, right? So the matter surrounding the core, okay, provides large force. Okay, as it collapses. Okay, and this huge, huge force then eventually results in an explosion. Okay, so let me just scroll down one more time. Let's see if we'll, uh, it doesn't matter. Let's cut that off. So, explosion occurs. Okay, and this is what we call a supernova. A supernova. That's when a star explodes. Right, so if I was to draw that in a diagram, because there's more than one thing you're left with. And so let me just, I can't use black again, but I'm going to use gray. This is kind of the core, right? Blah, blah, blah. And you get this massive explosion, okay, which is your supernova. Right, so this is the supernova, and this in the middle, I'll write in white so you can see it clearly, this in the middle is called a neutron, okay, it's called a neutron star, because what has happened when the explosion occurs, what is left in the middle is just a massively, massively dense a group of neutrons, only neutrons, okay, no protons, no electrons, only neutrons, and so we call that a neutron star, right? It's extremely, extremely dense, and they are in the middle of the star. Everything else is dispersed, okay, quite drastically in that supernova, right? 
the layers of the star are thrown outwards into the rest of space. And when that happens, you get a massive, massive amount of energy released, right? Huge amount of energy released. And that allows heavier elements to fuse together and form even heavier elements. So if you look on your periodic table, right, and you've got elements, um, I don't know, such as gold, for example, right? Gold has a um, or an atomic mass of 197, okay? Gold is not able to be produced on a light star, okay? So on a low mass star. Fusion does not provide enough energy in order to form elements that big, right? But in a supernova, that's how the heavier, heavier elements are produced, right? Because the increased energy as a result of that explosion allows heavier nuclei to come together and fuse. All right, one last thing is that this neutron star sometimes is not a neutron star. Okay, so if your star was massive enough, then rather than a neutron star, you could form a black hole. Right, there's no significance for me to write uh, writing this in green, just so you can see it and so you can see it's different to the neutron star. Okay, so the black hole only if your your original star was massive enough, right? What a black hole actually is. Now, the black hole is a result of the massive uh, mass of the original star. And what it means, okay, is that it has a massive gravitational force. Okay? The reason why black holes are actually black is because the gravitational force is so big that nothing can escape it. Okay, nothing at all. And that includes any kind of um, radiation, which obviously includes visible light. So you can't see them because light is actually trapped in that black hole as a result of the huge gravitational field strength. Right. And so uh, that means that they appear black because no light is emitted whatsoever. OK, so in summary, if we have uh, a load of dust in space, Okay, that dust comes together as a result of gravity to form a protostar, right? The protostar, uh, or inside the protostar, hydrogen nuclei start to fuse together, okay, uh, producing helium and then other elements, of course, as well. Okay, when the gravity or the gravitational force is equal to the outward force, that is when you start to call it a main sequence star. This main sequence star remains stable for a long period of time, often billions of years, okay? And our sun is an example of a main sequence star, right? When it runs out of hydrogen, then you have two pathways which the star can take based on its size. If the size is similar to our sun, and that is what we call a low mass star, then you have this pathway where you produce a red giant, which eventually runs out of light elements, but there's not enough energy in order to fuse the heavier elements. That then forms a white dwarf, which is way smaller, and it is emitting light, but it's no longer giving out any other radiation because uh, fusion's not happening anymore. And once that cools down, it's not emitting light anymore, and we call it a black dwarf. If the original star was a high mass star, then you have a red supergiant rather than red giant, which is only different based on its size, okay? So it's bigger than a red giant. But that's where the slightly heavier elements uh, are, be are fusing. Okay, but not the really heavy ones, okay, because there's still not enough energy for really heavy ones to fuse. But when that runs out, okay, and the star starts to collapse, the massive mass um, compresses the core of the star so much that you get a supernova explosion which releases a massive, massive, massive amount of energy and disperses the layers of the star into outer space. And that's how you get elements found on planets, okay, which shouldn't be there. Uh, because a supernova has occurred and dispersed the elements um, throughout the universe. And if the uh, if the star was big, but it wasn't, you know, massively, massively big, you have inside a neutron star. If it was crazy big, okay, don't write that in your exam, but if it was a lot bigger, if there was a sufficient mass, then you form a black hole, okay, which doesn't let anything escape because of its huge gravitational field. All right, so I'm gonna stop there. I hope that made sense. It's something which is often confused uh, in exams because there are obviously a few stages and you need to know the basics of each uh, separate stage and why it occurs, okay? So we're gonna stop there. If you do have any questions on that, please feel free to send me an email still though or comment in the box below and I'm sure I'll get back to you. But thanks again. Please do like and subscribe because it does really help me out and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.